give a talk on uh, the, autonomy, the possibilities of autonomy for labor and the political economy of social media. Uh, and uh, what I uh, did today, uh, when I tried to project that, I got a very strong voice. Uh, so I hope that you can uh, hear it in English. So I think that that is going to be useful to kind of uh, you know, focus the attention. Uh, what I'm going to say is pretty much the result uh, of uh, a, a synthesis uh, that I'm now presenting to you. Uh, between the work uh, uh, that has been carried out, research work and theoretical work on this subject that has been uh, carried out in two different sites, which uh, I find myself involved in. Uh, one of them uh, is an Italian collective, uh, it's the Free University Network Uninomale, uh, which is a network mainly based in the, in the center and north of Italy and involves uh, uh, people like Carinelli, Samuel Zadra, uh, quite a lot of uh, political economists uh, such as Christian Marazzi, Andreas Magalli, uh, Carlo Vercellone working between Italy, Switzerland and France. And uh, also you know, a, kind of a lot of militants who actually come to the centers. Uh, they also have a mailing list uh, and a website uh, which is collecting and translating uh, all the production coming out of this uh, uh, group. Uh, the other side of uh, knowledge production that I'm involved with is it's very different. It's a kind of established international journal called the Theory, Culture and Society, which I am on the editorial board uh, of. And uh, uh, Theory, Culture and Society has been publishing uh, uh, quite a lot about uh, digital media, uh, about forms of control and changes uh, in technologies of power uh, related to uh, cities, uh, related to globalization, uh, and uh, you know, all kinds of, uh, kind of issues. So, so in, a way, in particular, I've been following uh, uh, theory Reduction Society uh, thread on uh, the uh, neoliberalism and governmentality and biopolitics uh, and also that intersection with digital media. So uh, you know, a lot of what I say is going to be about that. Uh, when talking about uh, uh, the political economy of social media, because of this in my involvement with these different uh, sites of knowledge production, I thought uh, it might be useful to actually problematize uh, and historicize the notion of political economy. I mean, especially following uh, Foucault's work on the genealogy of political economy, so on the emergence of the very notion of political economy uh, starting from the 18th century, uh, it's become apparent that there's not such a thing as one political economy, but there is a trajectory, a historical trajectory of political economy which emerges uh, in the 18th uh, century. And uh, Foucault says, uh, interesting way, the political economy emerges as a critique of the, uh, the power of the state, of the absolute power of the state, uh, positing the existence of economic processes uh, which, are, which limit uh, and exceed uh, the power of the state and of the sovereign. Uh, but uh, at this point in the 18th century, political economy is still a monologue. Uh, it's a monologue of capital. So it's a story that, uh, that is the, the invention of the idea of economics in a modern way no longer the orcos, the, the household uh, economy, but the uh, economy of circulation of, uh, of commodities uh, in people. And then we have uh, Marxist political economy, which is developed uh, exactly to interrupt uh, the kind of monologue of capital about economic processes, <laughs> introducing the perspective of labor, introducing the perspective of workers, so introducing a dialectical, antagonistic, conflictual element at the heart uh, of uh, the economic uh, uh, organization. Uh, in the 20th century, uh, we have a, a transformation of uh, classical political economy, which has lost the political uh, in many ways. So it's become neoclassical economics, uh, it's gone under other, other transformations. And uh, it's that kind of economic, uh, mainstream economics uh, that is being taught today in most uh, economics departments, which are very monocultural uh, by our accounts. Uh, and I'm also uh, going to, uh, you know, compare to that, uh, we have this uh, Italian post workerist uh, political economy, which is uh, a revealing of classical Marxist uh, political economy, which I'm going to focus for most of today's talk. And of course, there's been uh, the critique of the, 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 the 60s and 70s uh, by people like Lothar, uh, Teresa Quattari, who argued that uh, political economy the, the division between the, the economic and the cultural, the division between the subjective uh, and the objective could no longer hold, that uh, economic economy always involves desiring investments, inv 
investments of this area, uh, which are quite uh, uh, crucial, and hence kind of reinvented uh, Marx uh, through their critiques of Marx and Freud in the anti uh, More lately, again, we have seen uh, a few uh, works uh, which engage with Marxism and contemporary neoclassical economics in a critical way, and I think they are also interesting uh, references. So critiques of political economy coming out of uh, Foucault's uh, recently published courses, but also uh, you know, Marxist uh, uh, theories such as Maurizio Lazzarato and uh, you know, not Marxist, but engage with Marxist theories such as Bernard Stiegler. So just to say that the field of political economy is, is got, uh, its own history, and it's also um, at the point of tension between different uh, perspectives. And maybe this is redundant for many of you who might be familiar with the work of uh, Italian workers and post workers Marxism, which has enjoyed over you know, the last uh, 10 years a kind of global uh, research, you know, following uh, uh, Negri and Hart's publication of Empire in the 2000, and then there's been a whole uh, uh, translation of Italian authors, Paolo uh, Irno, uh, especially you know, recently Franco Berardi. Collections. Uh, so, you know, if you go to especially American universities, I found that it's become almost hegemonic, you know, in political theory. Uh, you really find that they have absorbed uh, that. Uh, the three points of innovation uh, that the revealing of Marx uh, through the Grundis uh, in the 1960s uh, and the 70s uh, foregrounded, uh, marking an innovation in uh, Marxist thinking about political economy, can be uh, so summarized. The first move, and that's what I call the workerist, uh, is to say that we need to narrate uh, the history of capital from the point of view of labor, and from the point of view of living labor and its resistance. So they argue that capitalism is essentially conservative, you know, going against the grain of the idea that capital is the subject of everything. The capitalism, capitalism restructures uh, only were pushed to do so, not so much by internal crisis, but by labor's resistance. So, you know, the restructuring of the economy in the 70s was the result of the resistance of labor and factors, which led to globalization, digestion, uh, uh, and that uh, the, kind of the cutting edge of uh, uh, the, the light of flight of labor becomes the object of the next wave of capitalist organization. So, the resistance to labor happened through culture, culture becomes uh, cultural production, uh, becomes incorporated in the The other key point, uh, uh, innovation of the Italian post-workerist Marxism was the notion of the general intellect, uh, taken from Marx Grundis. So the idea that uh, the heart of the capitalist mode of production defined an assemblage of machines, knowledge and labor, you know, starting from the Industrial Revolution. So you must take into account the technology <laughs> and the way technology is assembled through human subjectivity to understand uh, what is going on. The third element is the theory of class composition and decomposition and recomposition. So arguing that at every time we have to analyze what is the internal composition of, uh, of class, how it changed in order to understand the struggles. So by chance, uh, work is it started with uh, research work going on in factories in the 70s in Italy, when a new wave of uh, workers coming from the south refused the ethics of work and also the trade unionism of the older generation. So this is kind of militant research uh, that, that, that still uh, uh, coming out. Uh, uh, again, in the last 10 years, uh, Italian post-workerism has started moving again. Uh, Uni Loma, again, is quite a uh, rich hub uh, of, uh, of research. There's lots of seminars organized. So there's a kind of uh, collective point of view developing you know, the current crisis and the evolution of capitalism. So there have been a thesis uh, uh, elaborated by people like uh, uh, Carlo Vercellone, which has talked about cognitive capitalism, controversial term, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, Andrea Fusagalli and Cristina Morini, who has also written about the centrality of the feminization of work, of the becoming feminine uh, of, uh, of labor, and we'll talk about biocapitalism and affected labor, as has been at the heart of the current economy. Uh, the whole kind of proposed the hegemony of the material and affected labor, the current economy. I'll say a little bit about that later, which is a controversial point you know, for many. Uh, then the idea that in the contemporary capitalist economy, the production of value goes on everywhere. So out, 
outside the, the spaces of, of paid work and the wage relation, but there's still economic activity going on. The centrality of social production to the contemporary economy. Uh, what Maurizio Lazzarato, who operates on a different line from this group, uh, is also a very interesting writer, called The Cooperation Between Brains, uh, in his book on uh, uh, Gabriel Tard, and the specific dynamics of social production, which he says are very different from the division of labor in the factory. One thing is if you have you know, the division of labor where everybody has a different thing, another thing is when there's a social interaction and social relations going on. And then uh, Arthur Negri, uh, more recently, and uh, most of the work in today's Unimomale is also around that, have been talking about the necessity of uh, creating new institutions uh, that correspond to the will of liberation of labor uh, from the current conditions, and they are talking about that together with jurists and people who specialize in law, like Ugo Martelli and uh, Alberto Lucarelli, the external, uh, the institutions of the common going beyond the alternative state and market between public and private. So this is the kind of uh, theory that has been elaborated today in this uh, network. So from this point of view, we can uh, say, so following this model, that the idea is that there's been a reorganization and a recomposition of the political economy of capital going on over the past 20 years or so. So we have a shift from the factory as the main hegemonic model of the organization of labor. Uh, factories have not disappeared, the factory is still there, but they're like subsumed within a, a larger logic. They're not the model, uh, the main model uh, that organizes the rest of the economy. So the factory is a receiving institution, uh, it's the main site of uh, social production, it's been replaced by the network. So we have an hegemony of circulation of our production. A hegemony of circulation is logistics, it doesn't just mean the internet. So logistical movement, the transport, it means the communication uh, networks, it means finance, it means new mechanisms of security and control, uh, which works through circulation and maybe uh, around circulation. Uh, this recomposition also involves uh, the end of the separation between production and consumption. Now we know that uh, in most social media today, consuming is uh, producing something. That is of economic value. So uh, there's also Stiglitz's argument that if we want to uh, get out of this crisis, we have to go beyond uh, the division between uh, uh, production and consumption, uh, which are a, class a classic of uh, uh, political economy. Another key feature of the current decomposition of labor, which is, uh, I think, uh, at the heart of the most interesting work being carried out right now by the Uninoma the network, and specifically by economists such as Christian Marazzi, again works in Switzerland, is the uh, analysis of uh, financialization as a new means of primitive accumulation. You know, the primitive accumulation is a Marxist uh, uh, category which uh, concerns the expropriation of the common uh, in England uh, in the uh, early uh, modern, which formed the basis for the accumulation of capital, and the proletarianization of uh, uh, the peasants, which then became the new labor force. The argument that, um, for example, Sandra Mezzabra is elaborating is that primitive accumulation keeps happening. That didn't happen once. <laughs> so the kind of violence uh, of primitive accumulation is something that is unfolding on a global scale uh, uh, still uh, today. You see that in the uh, rush to land, uh, in, to, to um, grow bio and diesel uh, in Africa. Kind of violence uh, is still there. But interestingly, uh, this history of primitive accumulation is linked uh, to the beginning of financialization as a strategy crucial to the recomposition of uh, capital in this context. So, Christian Marx, for example, has identified the moment uh, where financialization was introduced uh, as a strategy of power uh, in a specific moment, so the kind of this event like uh, nature. So I talked about the urban crisis of New York in the 1970s, uh, which was an economic and a social crisis, uh, which also had, had to do with the black population, you know, how exploited uh, workers in New York in the 70s. And he talks about the ways in which uh, the crisis, uh, which was also a fiscal crisis of the state of New York, was uh, politically and economically solved 
by financializing uh, the pension schemes uh, of the public sector workers of New York State. He said there was a key moment, the moment when pension schemes uh, become financialized. It was a key moment because he, he produced uh, new liquidity and because he made, uh, involved people in this credit debit economy in which we live today. Because pension, you know, workers became shareholders. Their pensions were part of financial, and became capital. You know, they, they weren't just stay there, but they became capital. So he sees that as a, at the beginning of the financialization of life. Uh, they has evolved uh, over the past uh, 20 years to the point that we know where we were today, where every, everybody is in debt, whether personally, privately, or publicly. So the argument that they're putting forward is that finance does no longer constitute a separate part of the economic cycle, but pervades the whole life of contemporary capitalist societies. Whether it's a pension, whether it's a public debt, whether it's a mortgage, whether you know, everything is connected to that. This is identified as a new regime of accumulation, which responds to the fact that the nation of value, the value we are producing everywhere, you know, whatever we do, you know, become capitalized, cannot be longer measured according to the traditional idea of working hours, and to this crisis of the possibility of measuring that value, you have financialization as an answer. So what they're talking about, uh, Marat is talking about uh, the fact that we can no longer talk about cycles, <coughs> this idea of cyclic financial crisis does not apply, but that there's a new temporality that is built within this new uh, pervasive uh, structural financialization, and it's the temporality of the bubble. When uh, something grows, grows, and then crashes down, and then something else is going to grow and crashes again. Within uh, uh, you know, this uh, context, financial markets, which have been presented to us uh, as this kind of uh, personified, theological, uh, Found of uh, rational actors, investors, and so on, once uh, mapped uh, through the needs of network technology, come out as very centralized uh, network, extremely concentrated, the result of decades of super managers, uh, and produce a topology of financial markets uh, as dominated uh, by a few super entities, uh, which we all know by now by name, uh, and the rating agency which they have called, uh, in a recent interview, collusive networks. Uh, collusive uh, because they play a game, and they play it, uh, you know, the, the, the game is not fair. It's rigged, you know, to start with. So, uh, uh, this is uh, you know, the argument, and the expression of this transformation of the means of capitalization is evident in statistics, which say that out of the overall wealth produced within society, a smaller a smaller percentage comes from wages, so paid work. We know we're working more for less money. You know, the intensification, the general intellect that we're hooked to this machine which makes us work faster and faster for less uh, money. And uh, instead, uh, also profit has gone down. So even the profit uh, that you know, the bosses are making out of their labor has not gone up very much. What has grown was uh, an economic category which uh, had been dismissed by the political economists of the 20th century, which is rent. You, know, you live off rent, you live off uh, position, basically, in these networks, and you extract value uh, through that. So statistics are quite clear that rent uh, is a major source of uh, wealth 